you were my brother, Anakin! Welcome back to Disney Marvels for week of July 3rd, 2022. This is episode 183. Disney Marvels, the show about Disney, Marvel, Lucasfilm, Muppets, Pixar, 20th Century, the parks, and much, much more. If it has to do with Disney, it's fair game. I'm your host, Matthew Graken. So we got the survey this week. And being that it's Independence Day weekend here in the United States, the summertime is upon us, celebrations are abound, and I couldn't think of a better way to kind of celebrate the summer season, America's birthday, than what is known as the Big White Way Broadway. Broadway is Disney theatrical, because it's not just Broadway. There's the touring shows, there's West End, there's so much out there. So... My question was, what is your favorite Disney theatrical show? Disney, uh, Broadway, West End, whatever it be. Disney theatrical. And the choices I gave initially were Beauty and the Beast, Lion King, Mary Poppins, or other. Because there is so many different shows that could have been on there that I couldn't list them all. Like Little Mermaid. Newsies, Aida, uh, Frozen, can't forget Frozen, uh, Tarzan, Hunchback, there's, there's Hercules, not too many people know about Hercules, Hercules is going around or coming out, so you got, you got all those options, I couldn't list them all, Aladdin even, but someone did put Aladdin, so someone did do a write-in for Aladdin, and uh, here's how it broke down. And, and that was just on the Facebook group. And um, yeah, it, that's the nice thing about Facebook. They, they let write-ins where Twitter, unfortunately, does not. But anyway, to the results. The survey, the polls in. And survey says, others get 7% of the vote. Aladdin gets 14% of the votes. And like I said, that was only a, a write-in on Facebook. So only on the Facebook end, and still bought in 14% of the votes. Mary Poppins. Ah, I forgot about Mary Poppins. I, I jumped ahead to the lad and I got excited. Mary Poppins also, unfortunately, only got 7% of the votes. So other 7%, Mary Poppins 7%, Aladdin 14%. And then up top, we have Beauty and the Beast at 36%. But we also have Lion King at 36%. Lion King and Beauty and the Beast tied, and they're both fantastic. And I can understand the argument for both. Both wonderful productions, wonderful scores, wonderful shows. So there you have it. You have spoken. And Beauty and the Beast and Lion King are your champions, per se. But no real runaway clear-cut winner here. There's a lot of diversity amongst the theatrical shows uh, voted for. And I, I love it. I, I love this diversity. Um, just, you know, just so many people. Oh, this one and this one and this one and this one. Thank you for all who voted and had your voice heard. And make sure your voice is heard. Your voice counts and your vo vote does matter. Next weekend, look for the survey coming out on the Facebook group and on Twitter. If you're not following e us on either one please join us join the conversation try to have a lot of fun put some news out there have some conversation on twitter it's at disney marvels on facebook the facebook group is facebook.com slash groups slash disney marvels podcast so join us either one join us on both because sometimes you get different content on both of them join us on both and uh be heard and uh on that bombshell We'll be back after these words from our friends and sponsors.
And now, on with the show. Hey, how about that nutty Star Wars bar? Can you forget all the creatures in there? And hey, Darth Vader in that black and evil mask. Did he scare you as much as he scared me? Ah, Star Wars! Even though Kenobi has come and gone, I cannot help but talk more about it. I, I want to talk about the series in a whole. I, I've been talking about the bits and the pieces and the this episode and that episode. And last week I touched on I touched on the series a little bit. But I think this series gave us so much to talk about that it deserves at least one final episode. And much like the surprise at the end of Kenobi, where force ghosts come and talk to Kenobi, I had to bring my own Force Ghost, or a Force Ghost with me to this episode. It is Anthony King from Force Ghost Conversations himself. Anthony, welcome aboard to your first time, first time of hope of many, on uh, Disney Marvels. How are you doing? Hello there. Happy to be here on Disney Marvels podcast. Long time listener, first time joiner of the show. And uh, I am ready to talk about this wonderful series and just all the great stuff that's happening at Star Wars these days. Oh, well, in that aspect, everybody, pull up your uh, pull up your easy chair, get yourself ready, get some water, get yourself some coffee, and settle in. We will be going for at least uh, 16 hours uh, today, I believe. <laughs> and that would be very easy to accomplish with everything that's gone on the last couple of weeks in Star Wars. <laughs> This year has been a bountiful uh, cornucopia of Star Wars goodness and, and the stuff that they keep giving us and things that we have to look forward to. I mean, start, we had Book of Boba Fett, we had now Kenobi, we have Bad Batch, Andor, uh, Vision Season 2 was announced, we had Celebration, mm -hmm. Celebration in Europe next year in, in good old uh, London. We have it just so much that they've been now telling us that's coming and coming. Where for a while it was, well, we had a movie and now we got this. And there wasn't too much. Oh, you got Mandalorian now. Oh, yeah. That was, that was really it. And now it's just they're gifting us with so much. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful time to be a fan of Star Wars. And it's also a wonderful time to become a fan. If you haven't before, if it wasn't something that you found interesting, there is so much more, I find, to to Star Wars now than just the movies that everyone knows of in one way or another. That you, you can find probably easily something that you can kind of connect with. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I say this just about every week on, on my podcast. This 2022 is the year of Star Wars. I mean... We're only halfway through the year now, and just around the corner is Andor, and I believe Bad Batch will be airing concurrently with it. September. Um, and golly gee, with all the other books and comics that are coming out at the same time, I know High Republic Phase 2 is supposed to start in October. Um, it's just an amazing time to be a Star Wars fan, and then even looking beyond to 2023, uh, there's so much in the pipeline for all ages, right? Just e even the, the little younglings that are getting involved in the Star Wars universe uh, to start with. Um, all the way up to us hard season fans, uh, looking forward to seeing, uh, you know, our, our friends, the Mandalorian and Ahsoka come back. Uh, Ahsoka yep. in her first time uh, being in a live action role, leading her own series. So that's, I, ca I cannot wait for all of it to happen. And, uh, you know, Lucasfilm's even dipping their toes in other things with Willow and another Indiana Jones film coming out. So this is a great time to be in the, the, the Star Wars and Lucasfilm bubble of it all. Oh, I'm looking forward to Indy 5. I was watching uh, one of the channels, the Paramount Network or whoever it was, had uh, was running a marathon of the Indiana Jones movies. And of course, I, I popped them on and just <laughs> love every minute of it all. Uh, I, I love just... I love Indiana Jones, most of it, the Indiana Jones. Um, and I, I'm excited for the for the next chapter. And it's it's hard 
you know, you know Harrison's getting older. And how do you replace someone like that? But at the same time, you want to keep the franchise going. It's this, this weird position that, you know, they, they're finding themselves in. Mm-hmm. Uh, something I always wish they would do was reboot the young Indiana Jones series that they had mm. back from the, was that, 80s, 90s? Uh, yeah, yeah, the early 90s, yeah. That I, I absolutely loved it. And I thought, I thought they, they did a superb job with the production of those shows. And you had the two different crews going so they were able to produce more of them because you had the young young one and then you had the teenager one right but then they also came out with these really good series of books that went along with it um mm-hmm. which i really enjoyed it i was never much of a reader i'm still not much of a reader but i wasn't much of a reader then but i read those books those books yeah. got me reading in because i just enjoyed them so much so uh yeah i i more indiana jones Wonderful thing. And these ones will be under the Disney umbrella and not someone else's umbrella for the time being. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, thankfully, now it's under the Disney umbrella. I know they just uh, unleashed a wave of merchandise uh, on the, the Disney uh, Shop Disney website for basically all the main artifacts, I guess, so mm-hmm. to speak, of the Indiana Jones saga. So I picked up uh, the Holy Grail this past week. <laughs> now, here, here's a question I want to ask you. Mm-hmm, sure. So I was looking at that. So my friend sent me a link, and I, I was looking at this stuff. I'm like, wait a second. Indy's jacket there. To me, it looked like the jacket was black, and I always remember, and I could be wrong, but I remember Indy's jacket being a dark brown. How, yes. how do, would you think of that? So I would agree that the main picture that they showed, it was more on the darker side, but mm-hmm. on the subsequent you know subsequent pictures uh, where they had like a like a model showing it off it did look more on the like the weathered brown side so maybe okay. maybe the one that we see harrison wearing is a bit more weathered so to speak from the adventures weathered. that he's been on uh so this is more of the pristine version like when you first buy it off the <laughs> off the rack i guess uh but uh yes it was a it was a steep 400 dollars that i could not muster uh, to, to, to part ways with at this point. <laughs> no. Back in my youth, I went to a London Fog Outlet, outlet and got myself a bomber jacket, which was almost identical. Mm-hmm. And I still have it to this day. The sleeves are a little short. And maybe my daughter steals it from me. Um, but yes, I, I have uh, a jacket like that that I, I have always passed off as my uh, archaeologist jacket. Ah, ah. Have, I have to. I found a picture of myself wearing that and a hat that I picked up. I have to send it to you. Oh, <laughs> so please you do. Please a do. Kick out yeah. of it. Um, but yeah, I, I saw those. I thought it was great. When I was in Disney World in August, in the studios, now the store is primarily Marvel stuff, but there was one corner that was dedicated to Indiana Jones stuff. They had an action figure and a few other odds and ends. It was just one one wall. I mean, just the fact that there's the one wall. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I just like, oh, this is, as a little kid, I wish this was here then. Um, it's, it's hard to justify a 40-something-year-old man uh, <laughs> buying, buying those things. Not that I would have any shame in that. Absolutely uh, not. I have to no. <laughs> explain it to my wife. Uh, but the, you know, the fact that we were finally getting more Indiana Jones. I mean, there was always the outlet, the little one kiosk by the Indiana Jones Stunt Spectacular, which, you know, but now that it's, it's spreading past that. Good stuff. Good stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, while we're still on the topic of Indiana Jones here, I, I liked your kind of wondering or question that you posed there of how to grow or continue the the saga that is Indiana Jones in some way, shape, or form. And uh, something that I've always been a proponent of is, you know, Lucasfilm over the last 15, 20 years now has been really good at their with their animation studios, whether that be the Clone Wars, Rebels, mm-hmm. Resistance, Bad Batch, you know, who knows what they're planning in the future when it comes to all this stuff. Uh, I always thought that, like, an Indiana Jones-centered animated series it's kind of set in the World War II era, explaining all of his adventures that he, that he did fighting the Germans during that time period would be great because then there's so many voice actors out there that try to impersonate Harrison all the time. 
uh, with, with whether it be Han Solo or other characters that he's done in his career, that's a great way to continue telling stories in that universe without having to really recast Harrison in a in a movie capacity or even a TV show, right? I think it'd be yeah a pretty high reward, low risk there for them. I I think that's that's an easy answer. Um, and there's so many adventures that you kind of know about or have heard about, mm-hmm. um, but not ever seen. Or, you know, some of it's been put to books, and then there's there's the other stuff. So why wouldn't you? I mean, maybe they could finally answer how he held his breath for the three days that the submarine was <laughs> tra- you know, going across the Atlantic. Yeah, good question. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, see, I always assumed he just kind of snuck in through, you know, through the the hatch and just kind of hung out there, and no one noticed him. But mm. that that's my justification in my head. Uh, but yeah, it, there's so much they could do with that uh, beyond necessary recasting. I I know I think their intents after C- Crystal Skull was have Shia trying to take over. You know, obviously that's not going to pan out as much as well as they were hoping. So. Uh, so you know, Plan B. Plan B, Plan C. Lucasfilm yeah. is open to opportunities for future franchises and all that stuff. So we'll see what happens with Five. Uh, I've got nothing but big expectations for it, and uh, we'll we'll see what happens. Not at all. Yeah, I mean, and he, Harrison, could still command the screen. I mean, from what we saw in uh, Force Awakens and. Rise of Skywalker. I mean, even the brief part in Rise of Skywalker, he commanded that screen. Oh, absolutely. I mean, geez, one of my favorite scenes in all of Star Wars, right there. Is that? Oh, absolutely. That was such a powerful scene. Yeah, definitely. Uh, whether you like the movie or not, you have to admit that there was such a gravitas to that scene that mm-hmm. you just, like you said, out of all of Star Wars, that is a very powerful and uh, prominent scene right there. So. Uh, yeah, so, um, I think we're setting a record here. We're, you know, just over <laughs> 10 minutes and we're already off topic. Good to go. We're, you know, your first time on the show and you already know how it's run. That's right. <laughs> uh, but I do want to bring up one other thing. You were at Celebration. I was, yeah. Very fortunate to have been there. Uh, that, that I am jealous. Um, I, I'm glad you got the experience to go and, uh, I know you enjoyed it a lot. You're going to, you've talked about it on your show. You're still talking about it on your show because it was that, that special of a, <laughs> it was, an occasion. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I would be too. Um, were you in the room when it happened when they dropped the Ahsoka trailer? Unfortunately, I was not in the room for that trailer drop. Um, I was only in the room for the big lucasfilm showcase panel that was that uh the 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 first day on that thursday where they really dropped all the a lot of the major news and uh, Mm -hmm. announcements for upcoming things um john williams of course came out at the end of that performance and then played not only the obi-wan theme for the first time uh he played the imperial march and also did the indiana jones theme and when they brought out harrison ford onto the stage and uh we did a great rounding uh you know ovation for uh for for both harrison and john at that moment but uh and then of course being in that room at that time it allowed me to come back later that evening to see the first two episodes of kenobi on this big screen in this theater-esque experience with wow all these other star wars fans and uh just uh basically it was a red carpet premiere world premiere of of the kenobi so show so to really be a part of that i mean that alone was worth the price of admission i mean frankly the John Williams concert that we got there for free was the <laughs> the the real like the I said to my wife afterwards this is really what we paid for here like it's all of our you know the four day passes that we paid for this uh this covers it all right here like we we pay this plus some in order to see John live at, at, at any other venue right but now that we get to do other Star Wars things throughout the course of this weekend like everything else is icing on the cake <laughs> and not just that not knowing at that time that he will be retiring so this is one of the last performances in a public setting that you know anyone will get to see absolutely yeah i mean i about lost it as soon as they were like uh we're, we're... kathleen kennedy said something like like we have to 
acknowledge a very special birthday that that just happened recently and so i was like this is john williams this is john williams and <laughs> lo and behold they pulled up this the the curtain and, and this whole full orchestra that was behind the stage somehow it, we were not prepared for whatsoever just strolled their way up onto the main part of the stage johnny williams walked his way across uh, across the stage and got up on that podium and uh went straight into the obi-wan kenobi theme so it was a, a lot of emotions happening at that moment in time and it was uh, truly incredible see what you did not realize was that the entire orchestra was created by ilm they it, were not actually there it was just all digital effects probably it was probably the volume like right they, yep. they filmed this all in the volume and it's just how good 3d technology is these days <laughs> you just didn't realize it it was that so convincing that you didn't realize in person that they weren't actually there i mean i believe it the way they put off the the effects in the kenobi series and the mandalorian and i know other movies and shows are using the volume technology so hey that's in that's in the very spirit of what Star Wars is, right? Even back to the beginning uh, of the first film, is Star Wars has always pushed the envelope mm-hmm. of what it is to be cinema, what it, what technology is available. George Lucas literally created digital cinema as we know it, yeah. Uh, and this that, that would be another step forward in the the evolution of ILM and Lucasfilm. <laughs> I mean the the and I said this last week the effects of for the void that they used um, in Kenobi, not the void. Yes, the you know the, vol- I mean. the volume. Yeah, volume. <laughs> thank you. Uh, void is the other is the video game part. There's the volume is the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can't come up with there. There's so much. There's 26 letters in the alphabet. You had to use B <laughs> for both of them. Yes. Um, but the effects rendering. For Kenobi it was so much more advanced than what they used in Mandalorian and Boba Fett, and it's just like, and there's not that much time spread out between them, mm-hmm. and just mm-hmm. how much that has grown. I mean, the the effects work in in Kenobi was spe- I, for me. I mean, correct me if you think differently. Spectacular. It, it was beyond anything that we've seen to date on any of the other uh, series. Totally. Yeah. I mean, you and I are both in agreement on this one here. I think that. Even from Book of Boba Fett to Obi Wan Kenobi, the the effects have only gotten better, and they're continuing to get better. And you know, it makes me excited for Mando season three and Ahsoka, right? Cause, you know, frankly, oh, I, the trajectory yeah. that they're going on is only getting better and better. So, you know, I I am excited to see what what those shows look like and what their cinematography is, because something that I took away from the Kenobi series overall, and I think there's some other factors to it as well, whether it be the pacing and the writing so on and so forth but kenobi to me was the most cinematic of all of like Mm -hmm. the disney plus uh star wars series is thus far whether it be the mandalorian and the book of boba fett um partially that's because i think due part to the writing like right the mandalorian and the book of boba fett had this very much serialized episodic nature to their writing where it would be like an adventure of the weeks so to speak whereas kenobi was a clear like beginning middle and end point so I think that had something to do with it, but just the look and the feel of the show overall was very much like I felt like I was in a movie theater watching it every week, which yes. is astounding. <laughs> yeah, it's something that I'm not sure if I mentioned on the show, I mentioned it to, to people in person. Um, on front of the podcast, Jim Hill's uh, looking at Lucasfilm, uh, his co- new co-host, Brian, mentioned that it, there's a difference between Solo and Kenobi. Solo is a multi-part series put together as a movie where kenobi mm. is a movie uh spread out over a six-part series oh interesting that's an interesting and thing. when you think of that it, it's you know uh, solo there's multiple segments that okay here's this part of the story here's that part you can extract mm-hmm. you know episodes as it were out of that where sure. kenobi just kind of it does flow one through the other one um, in very much in a cinematic way, just over almost six hours of a, a six-hour mm. movie versus two and a half to three. And this is a question that I posed last week, and let me pose it to you. Okay, great. So Obi-Wan Kenobi is now done. So do you think this story would have done done has done well as a six-part series? 
So almost, you know, like I said, five and a half, almost six hours worth of uh, film, mm -hmm. for lack of a better term, content. Or would have done well as the initial intended two and a half, three hour movie. Ooh, I mean, that's a good question. I think, I think personally, I prefer what we got for the TV series. And I think I'm going to explain this in a couple of ways here. Whereas that, first and foremost, I am a, I'm a prequel fanatic, right? I think that's, yes, that's a very fair, <laughs> fair statement here. I grew up with the prequels. They are my bread and butter Star Wars. Don't hate it's, me too much for my rankings. It's, it's okay. <laughs> um, like, those films are very important to me, and they still are. Um, they have, like, forged who I am as a Star Wars fan. And the fact that I get more time with those characters, especially the, those actors that portrayed those characters, bringing them back into these iconic roles gives a lot of credence to those films and makes them very important because I know there's still a lot of Star Wars fans that disregard them and don't include them at all in their rewatches. Um, so I think it just continues to add importance to that time period and that era and those movies. And that's something that I really appreciate from this series overall. So that's kind of one point there, but something that really stands out for me as I've watched the series overall is how important and impactful to me that the side characters in Kenobi were. So whether it be mm -hmm. Roken, Tala, Ned B, Haja, even the Grand Inquisitor and the Fifth Brother, right? All of these side characters were just so well done, in my opinion, so well written. They had so much nuance to them. And I'm so excited to see where their stories go. But if it was just a simple two, two and a half hour movie that would have been originally planned or put into theaters, right? I don't think you get as much time or you get to delve into the stories of these characters as much. And now that we, I, I think we're for the better having these these characters fleshed out a bit more. And uh, I now I think there's there's a push for uh, you know a Rava series or to see if Roken shows up in. And or where these characters go, I think there's a lot of added benefits to the longer form storytelling that was a part of this. And I think Lucasfilm, too, is much more thrilled about the, the week to week because this dominated the, the online conversations for for every week. Like it, you couldn't go on social media, at least in the channels that I follow and, and not be spoiled at all to yeah. every Wednesday. Like I had to avoid it until I, you know. The benefit of getting COVID was I could watch the episodes right away uh, at the right time. I didn't have to wait and agonizingly until I got home from work because I'm, I'm not waking up at 3 a.m. I'm a big Star Wars fan, but, nope. you know, I got I to gotta prioritize my sleep and, and earning a, a living before I can <laughs> support, I, support I my Star get up Wars fandom. I 4.30 in the morning myself. I'm not waking up at 3 o'clock. <laughs> exactly. Like, I did it once for The Mandalorian, and I said, Oof, I can't do this again. <laughs> I'm too old so, for that. No, you're no, your own limits exactly so like you know it, it went head to head against stranger things and beyond that first weekend where stranger things released all seven episodes kenobi was dominating the conversation week in and week out um so frankly i think obviously i think the story bits would have been the same so the the the, the arc of kenobi from where he begins to where he ends in the series would have been the same i think vader's would have been the same as well i think all the big cameos at the end would have been there as well so I think all the major plot points would have been there. And of course, with a two hour movie, I think the visual effects probably would have been more pristine for the cinema quality. But I think at the end of the day, Lucasfilm is thrilled with the product that they've gotten. And I think that this will give them more confidence moving forward with other big name projects. So I think they're very confident going into a, a, a Ahsoka series and who knows what they have in the pipeline beyond. But I think this series really showed them the power that the Disney Plus medium can have. Well, I mean, you have the one that I'm, I, that's really tickled my fancy is the Acolytes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, who knows what really is going to entail in that, that series. They've been very mute on the details overall, but like the sky's the limit for really yeah, what Yeah, because I think what, that one goes back to the Old Republic. I think it's a uh, set Somewhere 100 years before The Phantom Menace. So it should yeah. be the waning days of the High Republic. So 
that that's going to be interesting. I'm I'm just hoping my yellow lightsaber makes more of an appearance. <laughs> um, Fingers crossed. Yep. Yeah, I love my love me some yellow lightsabers. Um, so yeah, we 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 saw. And this is what I'm saying. It, it, there's so much content coming out, and also to think that when Ewan McGregor actually, and I love the fact that he came to Lucasfilm saying we we got to do this because mm-hmm. I think that helped his portrayal. Because I think Ewan did such a fantastic job. He did a, a good job in the prequels. I, I'm not going to take that away from him. He did a good job. He did mm-hmm. a fantastic job in this. Totally. He just, totally. He, the torture on his face and the um, dilemmas and just the just you know, the way that an actor portrays something um, really does a lot. And he really put himself into this role you know when fighting with the lightsabers there was just that much more tension there Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and just the way that he said lines um and just carried himself it was very you know you could tell that this was a passion project for him absolutely i mean even being at celebration you could tell that he loved being around fans who were giving him the energy that justified him putting that energy into the project. Um, you, I think so. And I think for all the actors too that participated in the prequels, like the negativity that surrounded those films at that time was daunting to them, and it probably waned on their experience at the time. And now that you know, people like me that were kids back then that are now mm-hmm. older and they we have we have stronger voices now in the community and we're going to these conventions or we're meeting with these actors and people and we're telling them how important those films are to us and what they meant to us back then, right? They're now feeling that energy that they didn't felt back then and now they have this renewed vigor and enthusiasm to continue on telling these stories. And you're right, I think that's a great point that Ewan's involvement in this series is is palpable like you can tell all the emotional beats that that uh he he did in his acting and i think really the volume helps out too a lot and in, in, in getting those performances out of these characters I, oh yeah i know he he talked a lot about back in the back in the day it was all blue screen and it's very hard to do you know acting when you're looking you're at, staring a at a tennis ball trying to imagine yeah you're looking at a tennis ball you're trying to imagine what the scene looks like and then you see the movie two years later and you're like that's not what i had in my head so actually being in the environments is is revolutionary for for these for these uh actors right and i think we see the benefits of that in in, in kenobi firsthand oh absolutely i i mean i remember i mean i'm a huge doctor who fan and th- these um watching episodes from the 70s where they were really starting using the green screen technology and kind of looking at y- you could tell that they're trying to picture something that in the, that technology was really new at that point that they had no clue what they what kind of environment they were in and trying to make the best of it and being sitting either sitting on a box pretending they're floating in the air or oh yeah <laughs> uh, it, it just you look back now and goes you know wait a second that you know how is this the same technology that we're kind of using now and it, mm-hmm things advance things change uh but now the fact that they're basically walking in a giant video game uh really changes the perspective because the actors know the environment that they're in they're not having to pretend in their head and then hopefully what they have in their head matches what the director has in their head which the head of the special effects unit has in their head and the art department has in their head that's a lot of heads to try and get together on the on the same page and when especially when you're talking science fiction the sky's the limit on what it could be um going back to doctor who someone was saying you know to design a spaceship is one thing but to design an invisible spaceship takes a (laughs) lot of genius yeah exactly um but again to your point that you're the prime example and I'm, i'm telling this to other people that this is where we're at now with the prequels and my expectations and my hope is that as much as people have bashed now the sequel trilogy Mm -hmm. force awakens uh, last jedi and the rise of skywalker my kids 
when they are close to your age in their 20s and their 30s those films will finally get the respects and you know john boyer daisy ridley um oscar isaac i mean he's already got so much <laughs> but all of them adam driver get the respect that they deserve for putting their craft on the screen and continuing the saga because we wouldn't have anything if it wasn't for them doing that you know star wars was almost a dead franchise i mean you had some of this stuff in the animation but there wasn't really much going on in the theater and then no. we get the force awakens and whatever whoever wants to rip it apart it is a solid film absolutely i love it <laughs> um it is beautifully shot it is it is well written it's got you know and it, it just continues the universe and just in those opening half hour it has expanded what is going on in the star wars universe that we don't know about seeing those um star destroyers crashed on jakku i want that story at mm -hmm. some point i want that story I, I want to see it on the the big screen and told to me because you, you know these massive ships and they're crashed into the planet into the sand how what what happened here so uh again there, there's so much more stories out there that we haven't been told and the beauty of these films is that they keep they give you one story and then they open up a hundred more tip of the iceberg storytelling that's what yep. star wars is all about and uh yeah it, it is um yeah it's, it's it's a wonderful thing and uh i i look forward to like i said those guys getting their due like ewan mcgregor's getting his due now uh bringing it back to kenobi doing a fantastic job uh hayden christensen donning back into the the armor um I personally was one of the ones that I was for me I wasn't ready for them to meet in part three I know mm. I've said this several times on the show um so for me it wasn't as I was a little more let down by the moment where a mm. lot of people got excited about it and I I can understand why gotcha for me I was I was I wanted them to build up more tension between them before mm. that happened um I liked how part five played out where it was that cat and mouse where they almost met and there's you know every moment they got it uh, a bit closer and a bit closer and you right. had a beautiful flashback that to me that was what i envisioned the show was going to be more like we still got it and um but the way that these things were shot and uh the the vision of the director she did she had such a great eye for the cinematic mm. in this mm. and the special effects like with the lightsabers how it lit up areas and the color and the glow actually was effective um it, you played the force awaken um not force awaken fall in order uh game oh yeah uh, you said and it reminds me of, at points you have to use your lightsaber to light the way mm -hmm. and walk mm -hmm. around she brought that now to the screen oh yeah absolutely um so you know, seeing those connections, uh, and just <coughs> part of me, the the way it all played out, um, visually spectacular, spectacular. Um, I didn't, and I I did have this discussion last week that I think though, unfortunately, some parts of the writing was really strong. For me, I felt there was a couple of parts where they could have done a little bit better. Like the Inquisitors, I think towards the end, got lost. Oh, okay in, in the storytelling um like the fifth brother was a um you know he he was the the matching piece to reva and mm. you know the catalyst against her and then he wasn't um after was that four i think was the last time we saw him yeah, yeah, he, he doesn't appear again after four, and neither does I think the the fourth sister, the other one that was popping around. Right, and and she didn't, you didn't get much out of her either. Um, so I I thought that you know with how cool these characters are, that I was, I wanted more from them. Mm. Which in some ways, you know, that's a good thing. You always want more, but other times you shouldn't be wanting that much more. 
So I, yeah. I, I wanted yeah. that much more of mm, the okay. Inquisitors because of just how cool these characters are. And you finally get them in person. We we have them in Rebels. Um, but I, I, I personally wanted them more in the, the live action, too. Mm. Uh, so that I, I thought that was one part. Um, but for me, again, I think the biggest one was Tala. I, I, I wanted so much. I, I love that character. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, for the the two and a half episodes that we got her, um, absolutely grew to love that character. She she rocks, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> I get why they did what they did, but at the same time, I'm like, no, too soon. <laughs> hey, what, you never what, know. What do you think of Tala? Look, I Tala is great. I mean, I we're in agreement here. Like, what she does for the st- like. With these side characters, I always look at it from the perspective of what do they do to serve the main character's story? Yep. And Tala basically tells Obi-Wan, look, you gotta get... You, your body not only needs to heal after the, the burning <laughs> that he Vader succumbs him to, but he's like... She's like, you gotta get your emotions and your... your just your... your your mental state back in back in swing here like you are a broken person sometimes you need someone to just tell you straight up how it is in order for you to recognize yeah. where the problem lies and once once the they have that conversation exactly like she that's what really puts kenobi back on the right path there then he starts to really reclaim these pieces that that make up the character that we see finally come fully realized i would argue at the end of episode part four Definitely in part five for sure, um, and, but she also has these great lessons in how to move on from the past, right? I think that's another big theme throughout this entire series. Is for Obi Wan especially, he's struggling to reconcile with the past. He's struggling to move on and 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 grow and learn from the past and become something better and move and rise above what what has come b- before him, right? And she has this great line, uh, like, right, so, you know, like, uh, to the extent of, uh, you know, some scars, some wounds never heal, something like that. But it's what we do afterwards that really defines who we are, right? So mm-hmm. she has that blast, uh, the, the blaster holster, right, that eventually becomes Leia's, where she marks for every person that she helped get through on the path, uh, right? It's it's this, this great lesson of, like, we not, we're not able to change the past, but what are, what are we able to do for the future that... You know, we can really change and define, like, what we do in the future is who we are now. Not Our past doesn't define us. It's what we do in the future that defines who we are. Um, and, of course, she, too, along with Ned B, has this great thematical element of action speaking louder than words. And that's consistent throughout this series as well, right? Uh, Kenobi at the beginning is this person that literally has a Jedi walk right up to him and he says... Uh, help me and he's like no go away bury your lightsaber in the sand don't do anything fly away don't bother me right and then at the end he's he he's he's telling these people how much they matter and he believes in them and he's he's a leader once again right and uh you know all these all these elements play together here and this really stems from from tala as a as a character right and let alone her great action sequences her stuff in part four are really great when she's literally risking her life on the line just to save Leia. Uh, that part where she's wonderful. confronting the, the security guard. Yes, yes. And she's us- literally using her her status as an Imperial officer uh, to, to question, like, how dare you question why I should be, shouldn't be allowed in here or where I'm at. And her, her conversation with Reva later then, too, how she literally goes toe-to-toe with a, an Inquisitor. Uh, amazing, amazing stuff. <laughs> yes, that... That she did a, a fin- fantastic job with that. Um, and let me guess. Go back to the Inquisitors. So, how do you think? How do you feel they handled the Inquisitors? Did you get enough from them? Did you want more? Did you want less? I think in in overall, I think I'm I'm okay with what we got. I would say I also didn't expect too much going into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I had more of a. F- I frankly, I think I got more than what I was expecting of these Inquisitor characters. I would have thought personally, I would have gotten more of the Grand Inquisitor overall, but 
I think for the story, what played out and what happened, I think it works for me. Uh, I, <laughs> I will say in our household, we've we've been using the line, uh, uh, revenge does wonders for the will to live. Pretty, <laughs> We've been using that pretty frequently around here for whatever reason, whatever that says about us and my wife, me and my wife's relationship. <laughs> we've been Uh-oh. having fun with that one. Um, so, revenge uh, is a dish best served. <laughs> um, we just love we loved what we got out of them frankly the grand inquisitor was a big standout for me uh, rupert friend in that role especially in part six uh his, his um you can tell he's tired of of vader's obsession with kenobi uh just the nuances of his facial expressions really gave that away and of course he's like you know we could take out the the entire path network over here instead of one lone jedi <laughs> uh but he you know you can only climb up the ladder of leadership so much before, you know, you got to have some self-preservation in, in yourself in order to make yep. it to tomorrow, especially when you're a part of the dark side. Uh, yeah. I, I would think, I think you're onto something there with about the fifth brother. Or I think, uh, you know, casting it an actor of that caliber too, I would have expected maybe a little bit more screen time, but once Rave became quote unquote, the grand inquisitor, his, his uh, jockeying for position no longer served its purpose right, for the right. story. And, uh, you know, who's to say what where they go next, right? Uh, Rave is still out there. She could try and hunt down these Inquisitors again. Who knows? Again, the sky's the limit for these future stories that they've got in the in the works. Yes. Uh, yes, indeed. It's, um, would you want a season two or are you satisfied where they are now? No, oh, this is a, this is like the the million dollar question right here. Yes, I it is. I mean, I will take a season two, but I think I'm perfectly fine with where they left off. I think if if I had to rank where I want a follow up series to go, because I think there's definitely some opportunities for follow up series is here. Oh yeah, I would personally put probably a Rava series or something around Rava and some of these side characters. You know, probably at the top there because of that that story of, of, of Raven and her character arc overall throughout the the course of the series and where we know she ends up and what she has to do is is very fresh for Star Wars and it's a very unique story where I you know we have these villainous characters who have done heinous acts and whenever they get redeemed or they come back to a light or you know they do they do a good act afterwards. Um, and they're no longer following this dark path anymore. They pr- they typically die, right? A la a Darth Vader, a, a Ben Solo. So now we have someone that actually lives, and they have to atone with their own past and have to forge a new way forward. Kind of similar in the vein of Kenobi, but with more heinous sacks in their in their uh, resume, so to speak. So I think that's personally at the top of my list. Something that I would put number two right underneath under that is I think I think there's more to explore Invader in the timeline here. I think mm. his defeat again at the hands of Kenobi begs itself for him to like reassert his dominance and power. I think that would probably drive him wild. Like it clearly did until the Emperor was like, are your thoughts clear on this? Like you served me, remember, right? <laughs> You're not going off on this Kenobi hunt again or you know we have some other things to do in order to solidify the power and he's like oh yes yes you're right I only serve you uh Kenobi's forgotten well it uh, was basically where I feel like you know Vader always threatens people here's the emperor threatening Vader in the basically. same way that's you know although you, like, know, you still like, have a, you still have a use yet for, I still yeah. need you Vader you need to go get in line order yeah get in line or else uh <laughs> We'll deal with you in our own special way. Exactly. So I think like a trial of some sort for Vader to reassert his dominance and position with the dark side and reaffirm why he's he's doing what he's doing. Right. I think that's very important in the in the Vader story to to keep in his mind uh, as to like he 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 needs this power. He needs to feed off of this energy, the hate, the suffering, the anger. Right. All this is within the core of his being, I think that would be very interesting to see um, how he reacts and, and it moves forward after this devastating loss, I would imagine, in the back of his head. 
Yeah, that would be that would be interesting. I mean, we get we do get some parts of Vader's continuing story in in Rebels. Yeah, yep. So, yep. and and this is where I I spoke last week about how if there was to be a season two or some a, a st- something stepping off from where we are now with the Kenobi series, we have to ru- worry about because these characters all show up in Rebels, so we have to worry about the crossover there. Mm-hmm. So that's that's where we get things a little bit interesting, uh, e- except for one character, which uh, it, I always I never can pronounce his <laughs> I can't say his name. It starts with the R. You know who I'm talking? Roken. Roken. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Look over my notes here quickly. Roken's character, we he, this is the first we've met of him. We know no idea where he goes. Um, I too am speculating. Do we see him again in Andor? Because time time wise lines up perfectly in just the the hints I feel that were dropped, where uh, you know Kenobi's going to him. People listen to you. You are a, a natural leader. People will follow you. Mm-hmm. Like, ooh, so he can be someone important going forward. This is something that uh, people are writing off that he's just a guest appearance and in, in, in whatnot. I'm like, I I think this is a potential building block. You and I are both in agreement on this one, too. I think Roken is, again, one of those standout characters. Uh, and I hope he appears in Andor. I hope he appears maybe... In his own kind of thing, I, I definitely think it's possible. Maybe some more time in Andor might lead to a future story or two, like yeah. you know, build some more interest in the character or whatnot. Um, and I think uh, definitely there there is something to say be said about this kind of on boots on the ground, non force user leader of of someone who I. I I would imagine he goes into the rebellion in some way, shape, or form. I don't think Roken is just going to be idly standing by as the Empire is is doing what it's doing, especially when these rebel cells start to really come up and and start to come together into a larger a larger sect. Right? I don't think that he's going to stand by when that when that happens. And yeah, yeah. Kenobi, when when Obi Wan Kenobi literally tells you a general from the Clone Wars and and a famed Jedi Knight says you have leadership capabilities you are are a powerful leader people follow you don't stop and he says i don't plan to i'm only just getting started <laughs> that's that's a cue for me right there that, that yeah. this guy's going places and and not just that whenever you consider there is no rebellion yet yep and he's not doing it to start a rebellion he's doing it out of because it's the right thing to do exactly yep you know he he sees what's happening and he's taking a stand to do the right thing because it is the right thing. Because it's right, exactly. Not because someone told him, oh, we need to start this rebellion or we need to be doing this or we need to be doing that. He's, he's just doing because it's the right thing. These people are getting attacked and repressed and killed for no other reason for being themselves. Mm-hmm. And we can't be doing that. Definitely. So, he, you know, he sets this this whole thing up, which... Yeah, you know, again, just out of the goodness of his heart. Absolutely. To create the the you know ongoing theme of hope that you know it's one of the cores of uh, of Star Wars. And um I, I thought that was that was so really well done. Um again, another excellent little side character. Like you said, a lot of these side characters were just nice treasures. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm out of out of this series uh so i i'm um thrilled to see where and hopefully we get to see more of this character uh i, I can't see why we wouldn't but you know you, you never know maybe we just get him in books but. maybe maybe i mean i'd be fine with that I'd, i do read all the books and stuff like that so uh, you being the more I'd avid okay reader than that. myself yes but uh i know for the more general Star Wars audiences, like, right, I uh, don't want to alienate them to potential wonderful stories that could be told about this character, and now we have some sort of connection with him. Let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah. 
What is your standout moment from this from the entire series? Oof. Um, I think for me, there's really three standout moments overall. So I'm gonna, I'll give it to you. I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think the first really big standout moment for me was in part three, which was actually the Vader fight um, originally. Um, and it's not necessarily the fight itself. It's the dialogue that they have back and forth with each other. And it's that line of what have you become? And then I am what you made me like, whoa. The chills went right up my spine. That's the line that I can imagine Anakin or Darth Vader at that point was, you know, he was probably festering on Mustafar, wondering what he would say to Obi-Wan Kenobi if he ran into him all these years later. And that was probably the line that he had agreed upon that that would be what I would say when we first meet up again. Uh, or at least something to that extent of like, you know, you created this. This is all your fault in a way. Right. Uh, so that was a, that was a very big and powerful moment with it, within uh, for for me watching that because you know seeing Anakin burned basically alive and all of his limbs chopped off in Revenge of the Sith so many times uh, back when I was ten like now him getting his little bit of revenge back for uh, you know a fist pump moment there you created this you did this to me that was a, a pretty big standout moment for me overall and we again we use that line a lot in the house here for some reason <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about your marriage, but that's, you know, between <laughs> you and your wife. Exactly. And she, the couple times I've heard her on your show, she sounds like a lovely woman. She is phenomenal. I got her on TikTok, and that's usually where we we use this. As, she's like, "You got me on this. You did this to me." <laughs> <laughs> I said, "What have you become?" And I am what you made me. All right. Mm, I, I'll go. take that. I'll take it. The second moment that really stands the out. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, the second moment, of course, again, being a big prequel fan, is is this flashback sequence. Um, now, uh, to this pre-Episode 2 Attack of the Clones training sequence, that is, between a younger Anakin Skywalker and a younger Obi-Wan Kenobi, where they're pretty much in their Attack of the Clones garb, right? I mean, you can still tell they're a little older, uh, just actor-wise, but, you know, just yeah. some... Makeup, touch up, and all that stuff. Very minimal de aging, if anything needed for that. I'm okay with it all. It looked good to me. I, I was wondering that too. I, I thought, okay, they're really not using the de aging with this. It looked, it's mostly practical effects, aka makeup, uh, to to make them look younger. They didn't, for a reason, use the de aging effect that they've been using the other stuff, and I was okay with that. Yeah, and, me and too. I think in some ways, you got more more of the expressions and more of the the acting was able to come through definitely yeah it seemed very natural the and you can tell these these actors were <laughs> felt like they just plucked them right out of 2002 and put them <laughs> in yeah. a 2022 uh series in terms of how they portrayed these characters again like the the staccato of how they fought each other the choreography of of the uh of the fight itself was like very reminiscent of what they would have done in the prequel era um, so just that overall, but we'll, not only the, the fight and the look of it all, because it was great seeing that imagery once again, um, it was the meaning of, of that fight and what it meant for the series overall and how it really distilled what, it, as a character, what Anakin Skywalker and subsequently Darth Vader is too, right? Like the, the dialogue they have back and forth, right? Anakin's need for victory blinds him. He can't see the larger picture overall because he needs to prove himself. He has this desire for victory. And uh, and it's a lesson that obviously Anakin and Darth Vader still has yet to learn because it, it affects later on in part five, like, right? The juxtaposition of it all. Like he's yeah. focusing entirely on Kenobi. He only cares about Kenobi when... He could have taken out the entire base in a larger picture, but his need to like best Kenobi, his need to prove himself and become the take over his master and that that hurdle that this person that has been I say this a lot. He Vader sees Kenobi as the bane of his existence, right? He's put all of his anger and rage into this one person. He has blamed him for everything that happens. He blames him for for why he was treated poorly as a, as a Jedi, why they withheld information from him, why he couldn't save Padme, why Padme's dead, why he's stuck in this coffin, basically, why he's just a no arms, no legs 
uh, shell that is has to be in a back to tank anytime. He's he's chained to this machine, this clunky Frankenstein esque monster robotic machine that he's he's tied to. Uh, all of that is blamed into this one person instead of reflecting on. Wow, I probably put myself into the situation, didn't I? <laughs> the, the healthy way to maybe look at it. maybe I went wrong somewhere. Maybe maybe it was me. Maybe I should have done something differently along the way. I don't know. Either. We could go on and on about that one, but uh, that that need for that that need for him to be victorious against this and to take out and to make Kenobi suffer, right, blinds him to everything else that is going on, and it's why they're able to escape. Why it's why they're in part six, it's why Kenobi is able to best Vader at the end of the day. He just, he's unable to see the larger picture, and that is his ultimate downfall. It's a lesson that, frankly, he never really learns, I would say, until Return of the Jedi, when he one-ups the, um, the Emperor by doing the unexpected. <laughs> yep. Uh, and, of course, Luke is the unexpected first and then too, and it kind of gives him, I would say, the motivation and, and the, the belief that he can do this. Uh, but that, for what that, that, fight sequence means overall is is really powerful to me. And then finally, of course, I think we would all say probably that Vader uh, Obi-Wan fight sequence in part six, I would say, but more specifically, it's when the part of his helmet is exposed and you see Hayden Christensen, mm, um, yes. you see his face, you see the scars of it all, you get to see, you hear him talk to Obi-Wan and what that means for the character overall, for Obi-Wan, I would say specifically. Um, now, I know people, there's a lot of theories on online and stuff like that uh, about, like, is Anakin in there? What parts of this is Anakin speaking? What parts is Vader talking? I know the lighting does a lot of, it's a, it's really open for interpretation. So I think I will let that up to each person to decide on their own if they think it's Vader the entire time, if it's a little bit of Anakin here and there. Right, I think it's, there, all these opinions are valid. I think it's great. I love the discourse surrounding it. Um, but the thing to me here is, like, this is literally Kenobi's chance to say, I'm sorry, right? This is him to look at the thing that he has held, harbored all this guilt for. The thing that obviously it haunts, it, we've seen it, it haunts his dreams, right? He in the, in the earlier episodes, he's haunted by this. He was confronted by this thing that he considered to be his greatest failure. Uh, the, the boy that he, he, he basically was a father figure to that, that uh, turned to the dark side that, you know, he, that caused all this turmoil and, and destruction, destroyed the family that he had uh, and uh, put him on this solitude path, uh, right? He's able to say, I'm sorry for, for everything that happened. And then inadvertently, I don't think that this was really the plan. I think Vader was trying to like showcase his power in this sequence, but inadvertently he says like, I am not your failure, Obi-Wan. You didn't, but he's basically saying, you didn't do this to me, I did, right? You didn't Which kill is opposite Anakin than Skywalker. what he said in in three. Yes, definitely, definitely. He's like, you didn't kill Anakin Skywalker. I did. And I then, know. of course, he does that the the same way. I'm going to do it to you, right? And you know, uh, that was such that a, is that's a, such really a powerful. really yeah. powerful moment to me. And and it's also I think it explains too why in the original trilogy, why uh, I in my belief and and my understanding and my you know interpretations of the Anakin Darth Vader character is that there are two two beings in, in one, right? There's, there's Anakin and there's Darth Vader. They're not the same mm -hmm. person, to, to me at least. Um, so Despite that's why he's Hayden able... Says. Okay. I agreed, agreed. I, <laughs> I know. I, I will... George would say otherwise, I would think. So I, I think many people would, and I think that scene would say, other than what, you know, other than what Hayden said, that they are... The, the, du the dual nature, you know, there's that duality of two in that one um one person exactly uh, yeah and I, I i agree with you on that yeah and the, the so nature. basically this is obi-wan being absolved of of the the sins of the past this is that final nail in the coffin of him being able to to move on right this is that last thing that he needed to confront this is the last bit of of fear and worry and doubt in his life and he's able to realize that like all right anakin is the reason for why he did this he put himself in that position. I could have maybe done things differently, but that's in the past now. Like at the end of the day, he caused this turmoil for himself and he's the only one that can turn himself back from this, right? And which is eventually what happens later on. Like he comes back, he chooses to come back, right? He's not at a point where he's able to come back or wants to come back, which I think symbolically is really interesting too, because 
Kenobi's able to get a piece of the helmet off. Mm-hmm. Ahsoka later in season two of Rebels is able to get a piece of that helmet off. On the other side. On the other side, of course, too. Yep. And the but at the end of the day, in Return of the Jedi, it is Luke Skywalker ultimately through his through his merciful sacrifice that is able to lift the remaining parts of the the full helmet off. I guess if you uh, if you want to say it that way, right? Um, mm, I you know what I never looked at it that way that the the symbolism of the the breakature of the helmet you know that getting little pieces of here but Luke being able to fully fully remove it and liberate ah brilliant yeah I'm I'm glad I could uh, impose uh, some uh, some thematic wisdom on you here <laughs> well see and I I was going to go back to what you were saying just before about the the drive of of Anakin slash Darth Vader of um, focusing the negative on Kenobi that uh, Kenobi is the reason for everything mm-hmm. and it's that fine line between love and hate that again an age old um, literature theme that you know to love someone that much. But it doesn't take a lot to just cross that line to hate someone or to blame them mm-hmm. for the reasoning of X, you know, totally. whatever the, the story may be. In this case, being um, his downfall, his you know everything that went wrong in his life is because of Kenobi, not because of you know can't take the um, turn it inward. So you turn everything outwards and you find someone even has nothing to do with it or very little. But since you have such that bond in such that relationship with that person that they become uh, they become the problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, And that's yeah, and something that that does play out throughout this series, throughout er everything with them. Um, And it's. uh, The way that scene is done, I'm talking about in, in the battle in episodes uh, part six um not not so much the battle but that last part mm-hmm. where they're having that exchange and vader finally says it wasn't you it was all me and finally accepting the blame or taking it inwards which is a a huge step for that character mm-hmm. more character growth but how it was done again deborah chow just the way that it was shot the way it was presented in the the changing of the voice and Mm -hmm. uh the camera angle and the the eyes and everything just telling the story beyond it's not just telling you with words it's not just telling you visually it's using everything visuals uh audio um the written word everything is telling this story and that is just fantastic cinema totally yep um so that i i think she did a she has proven herself you know bring it to to deborah chow as a spectacular director um in this medium you know what she did in mandalorian was good this was beyond my expectations mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. as far as a, a cinematic uh, event yeah I agree. Uh, in a vision the vision that she had for this and the way that she was able to translate that vision onto the screen um is something that i am excited for whatever her next project being me too i hope it's something in the star wars realm i would love to see it um oh, you gotta keep her you gotta, you gotta, keep you her gotta the, do something to keep her happy yep yep keep her keep her in the, in the lucasfilm family some way um and to your point too, I think it's 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 fascinating how, to my knowledge, I think this is the only Disney Plus series that has had a consistent one director across the all the episodes. And I think a lot of the criticism from some of those, especially the MCU shows, is like some episodes are more favorable because there are cer- certain directors right doing doing those they're doing those episodes and. Maybe they would benefit more from having a consistent voice across from beginning to end, and I think we're seeing that with Kenobi for sure. It's that the consistency is definitely there from start to finish. 
Right. <clears throat> yeah, and um, you you could be right. You could be onto something there. <clears throat> a lot of shows do do that, and that's not anything abnormal as far as TV series go. Um, and, th- and that's one thing. If there is a flaw to point out for the prequels or the sequel uh, trilogy, is mm-hmm. that in the middle you you not only switch the director, which George did that with the original ones, but you switch the writers, and that you know that's where you get some of the the um, uh, change in in voice and tone and um, how the the presentation of the whole thing. Here you keep the same writers, and this one you keep the the same director. Now, it's a lot of work for one director to do, a, <laughs> you know, a six hour project. Yeah, you know, when we're talking, even the directors who do movies, you know, that's two three hours at most. You know, mm-hmm. three hours and fifteen minutes. That's you know, this is almost doubling that. But if you can also keep taking in the fact that that's the final product yeah it's you know not taking into the effect of how much was edited out Mm. and you know there's always at least maybe 10 minutes per episode maybe more depending on you know on the 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 event and so you know sometimes you you see just quick cuts but that quick cut could have been a 15 minute segment that you're already seeing 30 seconds of Agreed. Yeah. So that it's it's a huge burden. It, it's um it's a lot for Wonder Director to take on, which is typically why you spread it out. And then also you get the different viewpoints, and it changes up the tone and the pacing, and also helps keep the audience interested. In it. <laughs> yeah. Um. So it's because I mean, think of the Mandalorian. If we just had John Favreau telling the whole thing, you would have had some of the beautiful ones that um. Ah, uh, name escaping me. Guy who's doing Love and Thunder. Uh, Taika Waititi. Thank you. <laughs> Some of his beautiful work, and uh, same thing with um, uh, you know how bad I am with names. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, girl from Jurassic World. I was gonna say Bryce Dallas Howard. <laughs> Thank you. You know, and. I think she did some fantastic episodes. Again, she's establishing herself as more than just an actor. She is establishing herself as, you know, following in her father's footsteps as mm-hmm. a bona fide director. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the first season was was good. The second season was getting even better, The her, her work. So, again, you're growing this... The, this um, next generation in house, literally of, yeah. of talented and capable uh, directors, um, and you know where are we going from there? The, you know the sky again is the limit, uh, and I I think you know they got to play their cards close to the vest and try and keep these people around, because mm-hmm. um, I think. You know, is it always nice to get some big name actor who's done or act, director who's done uh, some of these other projects and, you know, done really well with some of these other projects? Yes. Like a Taika Waititi. Oh, OK. You know, he, he talk about someone who's going to change the tone of something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Agreed. Uh, but he also likes to get involved in his work. So that's he's always bringing himself into the picture somehow by playing one of those uh, offbeat characters. Mm hmm. You know, you know, he he did the the IG Eleven, who became one of my favorite characters from the first season of of um, the Mandalorian. Um, he does Korg in the the Thor movies, so he, he you know he he brings himself in there. But you know that's as far as Star Wars goes, that's good for a little bit. But how you know we will see how he does on the the full. Uh, the movie thing, and I'm I'm sure it's going to be brilliant. It's going to be a very different Star Wars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and I think people have to accept that before going into it, because it's going to be how he would tell Star Wars. Which there's nothing wrong with that. You just can't expect. Oh, it's not the New Hope. No, it's not going to be the New Hope. It's not going to be Rogue One. Oof, it's going to no. <laughs> be its own thing. 
Uh, but we've been introduced to his style already now in the Mandalorian. So hopefully, you know, the 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 ones that like to uh, proclaim themselves as the ultimate fans. <laughs> <laughs> I use that term loosely. I'm sorry. Um, realize that. Oh, wait, this is just like, you know, these episodes of Mandalorian and, and whatever else, he's, you know, done between them. And, you know, it's now in, in Star Wars and. It is okay. Um, yeah, the uh, directing wise, the vision the, between you know marrying the special effects and just the, the way everything was shot. Um, I did have problem. What was it? One of the episodes. I don't know. Is either the time or day? I'm not saying that it was a problem. <laughs> the problem being that it was a very dark episode. I think it might have mm. been right. Um, where I had trouble seeing. Who was on the screen? Because <laughs> yeah. I'm watching on my my TV in my living room, and it's just like there's other ambient light in the room, so it's just like I'm I'm trying to make out who is what's going on because everything is so dark. Yeah. Um. And and that happens. Um. Uh, that happens. But it's uh, I think she did a phenomenal job. Um. I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna skip over talking about this one character. And uh, so I'm, I'm sure you said you've listened to episodes before. We do this thing. Who is your MVP character of the series? Ooh, okay. Okay. Who would you say was the standout character for the entire series? Ooh, the, the standout part, character? Big part, whoever, it, whoever you deem it necessary or worthy. <laughs> the who, standout... is, who is worthy? Who is worthy? Well, let me tell you. I'm surprised we haven't talked about this character to the point to this point yet in the series or in this, this episode. Probably why I haven't talked about that this particular character. Not assuming anything. But uh, young, a younger Leia is really for me the big standout. Like watching this uh, this girl who was first kidnapped. We start to see the bits and pieces that make up the Carrie Fisher Leia that we all know and love from the original trilogy and then the sequel trilogy too. We start to see all those aspects of this character form through this bond that she creates with Obi-Wan Kenobi over the course of this wacky, wild, crazy adventure that they go on where she starts off having no idea where she's going in life, kind of a prankster jokester looking towards the horizon. What is you know, proverbially her twin sons, right? What is she, she's looking out for this adventure she wants to be on. She wants to go off to a distant planet and go off on some, you know, pirate pirating adventure or something like that. She wants to do something differently than what her parents have set forth for her. And towards the end, she not only realizes that she can do good in the world, she's, ex she's enhanced by all the people that she's met along the way and these relationships that she's, that she's fostered through this, through this uh, tale. She learns that leadership comes in all different shapes and forms and sizes, right? And uh, the the inspiration that Obi Wan Kenobi gives her by believing in her, empowering her to succeed, to be this this uh, person that goes into the wires, right? Uh, even when Roken's like, "What? Well, you can't do that. We can't send a, a little girl in there and do this." No, Obi Wan Kenobi says, "Do you trust me? Well, I trust her. Let her do it." Yeah. Um, that full belief in her is really astounding. The uh, you know, she believes in herself, I think, towards the end of it all. Um, she's much more confident in herself and her abilities. She believes that she's going to make an impact in the world one day. Um, that is, I think, the little Leia is really a standout. And, of course, we got to see the actress at, uh, at Celebration during the premiere. She got a huge standing ovation from the crowd, rightfully so. She was just such a delight in the way she was able to bring that character to life interact with both Obi-Wan Kenobi, Bail Organa, her mother Brea, or, or adopted mother Brea Organa, um, just how she interacted with other characters throughout the, the series. So it's, it's had this, all, all the pieces of, of Leia, again, are, are there, whether it be trying to escape and in, in every time that she was, uh, uh, you know, bounded up in some way, whether it be by Red Hot Chili Peppers bassist or, uh, or when Thank she's God being... Thank God he was fully dressed. 
Exactly. Or whether she's being uh, interrogated by an inquisitor, right? She's always looking for one, a way to, to one up the situation or thinking through the larger picture at hand of how she can escape, right? Which is something I fully believe about the Leia character on the Death Star is like, I firmly believe that she's formulating a plan to get off of that mm -hmm. herself. She didn't need Luke Skywalker or Han Solo to pop in there uh, and, and to come rescue her. She was def forming a plan on her own right. She was waiting for some a uh, stormtrooper to come in, she was going to knock him out and, and escape on her own way, right? Uh, all that is there, her, her, her accepting that she can do a lot more good in the world than what she's doing currently, like, this is all impactful to me and very powerful stuff overall. So, Leia is my MVP overall. Well, I definitely agreed with you. <laughs> <laughs> As everyone heard last week, I, I same thing. Um, I, I, Watching Vivian's portrayal here makes me want to go back. I mean, I heard good things about it. I want to go back and watch Bird Box because I'd, I'd love to see her, mm -hmm. how she did in that. Yeah. Um, just realizing recently that, that it's the same actress. Um, she, yeah, I, I spoke so much about her last week, but you, you are absolutely, she did a fantastic job pulling off that, I mean, physically, you only can do so much, but the the maturity that she brought to it, um, she only turned ten in June. Yeah, I mean her career <laughs> is only going to take off after so this point. Yeah, playing up in age. Uh, she, but she does she did such a good job in, in, you know, definitely worthy of all the accolades that she she was getting. Um, I I the way she embodied that character uh, does so much credit to Carrie Fisher. Um, honoring that character and playing it so respectfully. Mm -hmm. um, she she's you know a, a very bright and young budding actress or actor, whatever the proper terminology now is. Yeah, that. right. Yeah, but yeah, uh, she 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 does so well, and I look forward to what she she does next. And I'll discuss this with you. Because I don't think I brought it up with anybody else. So Kathleen Kennedy now has recently announced they will no longer be recasting roles uh, with younger um, actors, actresses uh, to portray characters. Mm -hmm. Now, I was wondering here, though, at what point is that starting? Does that mean going from now <laughs> going forward? Because you could always say, well, this is, you know, I will not go back and recast a Han, uh, not Han, think of somebody that they haven't done yet. Uh, I won't go back and recast John Boyega's Finn character. I won't recast a, a younger actor to play his part, you know, in, in some before New Hope uh, uh, story. But you've already casted Han Solo, you've already casted uh, Lando Carissian, uh, Luke and Leia, mm -hmm. uh, and all these other characters. You've already cast them, so you, at this point you could still use them going forward because you're not recasting them. You're just rehiring those actors to continue a part that they've now already established. Mm -hmm. Which gives us, you know, considering that Lando is, an, is something that's been uh, milled about in, in the, hopefully in the work still. But it's something that has definitely been a topic of discussion of something that they, they want to pursue with uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan reprising that role. So you can't say that we're not using characters from the past, which something I know that you're personally hoping for as well. And so am I <laughs> yeah. is, you know, continuation of Solo and, you know, bringing that actor back and continuing forward and I, I personally think as a Disney Plus series, everyone would lo come to love and accept this role and this actor in that role and where we can go from there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kenobi has proven that we can do this. Why can't we do this with Solo? We can definitely do it with Lando. Um, and the cast of characters that we've already reestablished with with uh, younger casting uh, and continuing expanding the universe. Um, something that I like about Mandalorian, uh, I liked about Book of Boba Fett, 
is we're getting away we got, got away from the jedis and particularly the the skywalker storyline mm-hmm. you know kenobi brought us back to that which is fine for kenobi um but i, I like how we're fleshing out the ga- the galaxy is a big place yeah you know seeing more about it something that um and i'm sure you heard me talk about this on book of boba fett i i wanted more of the the crime the underworld mm-hmm. of the the galaxy you know we we get tidbits here and there and now this is some, you know a series that i thought could have brought in more into it and unfortunately it didn't go exactly as i was hoping with that you got more just boba fett's uh, redemption storyline which was great uh but th- there's so much to tell in the the underworld story that uh you know that's something we could we could focus on um something that i'm particularly looking forward to Andor. again it's it's not jedi centric it's rest of the world centric Mm-hmm. Uh, something that they're doing with they didn't bet they're doing well in bad batch again it's telling the rest of the, what's going on in the rest of the universe yeah um yep yeah, that's all right i again just going on one of my little rants there <laughs> <laughs> all good i'm here for it all hey, what are you looking forward to in um you know your choice of directions you know do you want to see more of some of these characters that they've already recasted and bring forward uh do you think that's something that they they will potentially still do um or what what direction do you think star wars is going to be heading i think in regards to kathy kennedy's comments i i'm a little hurt by them i would say in a way i think it's a bit of a knee-jerk reaction yeah Um, i think that comment alone it just it's a misunderstanding or a misallocation of what where what went wrong with solo if anything like obviously it underperformed at the box office i think we'll all agree with that but i don't think that was because of alden aaron reich as as, as han solo at least you can't put entirely the 100 percent that as the sole reason why right it's because the film came out so close to the last jedi right it wasn't able they didn't even have a trailer for the movie until february uh, a few months before it came out, so they weren't even able to promote it at the same time that they would have, or at least the same promotion schedule that they would have with other films. And it also came out like a couple weeks after uh, Infinity War, and and you know it was in between that and I believe Deadpool too. So like <laughs> at a time when people aren't really going to the box office and they have to like hand pick where they're going to, right? It, they were just all. It's just it got slogged into the to the mess that is the summer blockbuster season where only a few handful emerges victorious and you know it might have been the hubris of, of thinking that star wars is immune to all of that but you know i think if it was in december we'd probably be having a different conversation right now if they would have released it uh, push it back right? but i know uh bob Iger is very candid about that in his book um uh the right of a lifetime where he was at he was the one pushing that solo stays in that may release spot where kathy kennedy and others at lucasfilm were you know saying we should push it to december move it uh, right but he said nope we're gonna do that and you know he's he's fallen on that sword a bit so you know i think that is more the lesson to take from this is market your films appropriately with a lot of lead time and uh uh don't like oversaturate your audience don't compete against yourself and the own disney family right compete against the other studios and stuff like that put put your product up against other things don't don't compete against uh your your very very successful avengers franchise that is also coming out just before it um so i think that's more of the takeaway so that may be the the policy right now Um, it's four years later too it's 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 definitely so like i don't know maybe i think as 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 clearly what we've seen with kenobi is that there is an interest when these characters that mean a lot to us um i think you know, I'm hoping that they change this this internal policy as maybe a year or two goes by, right? I don't think it's going to stick forever because they're going to want to keep telling stories with these characters. And if they already have an actor ready to go and, and they're available, why not, why not go with it, right? I think to your point, too, it's hard to think of uh, an actor or a character that hasn't already been... Uh, recast as a younger version of themselves or maybe even an older version i think they would just go with the same actor if they were going for an older version so 
Uh, I don't think there's any really like big legacy characters anymore that that requires a younger recasting. Uh, so I think it's this is mostly in regards to the potential of a solo too, which I think there's a lot of fan fervor for it right now. At least at Star Wars Celebration, when they brought Ron Howard out to talk about the Willow series that's coming up, mm-hmm. there were a lot of people in the audience yelling "Make Solo 2." When he was up at the the live stage where they were live streaming conversations with these creators and actors, they brought Ron up because he's working with this uh, documentary that they're doing for Disney Plus about ILM. Uh, a lot of people were yelling "Make Solo 2" there, and the people were applauding Solo and stuff like that. So, Good. obviously, they're moving forward with like potentially a Lando series that's in the works. Uh, you know, I. I I'm very intrigued about, you know, if that could potentially serve as a quote unquote solo too, depending on when that takes place in the timeline. Um, I know they they constantly are doing like Han comics in the, at quote unquote when the solo two timeline would be taking place. So I don't know if that's testing the waters right now. Um, but I think if the right story is there, I don't think that they will hinder themselves from the creativity that is being put forth in front of them. It's, it's it's it just seemed to me like a knee jerk reaction to a question that she probably wasn't expecting <laughs> in the interview. That'd be something, my initial takeaway. Something else, and I don't think people are looking at this angle either. That I was thinking of. That, for mo- again, looking at one aspect that, as we just discussed, most of the characters have been recasted already. Now. We also have situations like we've just seen in Mandalorian and Book of Boba Fett with the, what's the technology that they use for Luke, where you have a body double, not a recasting, a body double, walking around with Mark Hamill's face on him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, the deep fake stuff, yeah. Yeah. And is she more confident in using that going forward? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Maybe uh, that's just a, a, a different as, a different perspective on it that maybe I think a lot of people weren't thinking, you know, she's, you know, we're, we'll use more of that going forward because worked great in a uh, book of Boba Fett. It really did. It really did. I wonder how much that costs, though, too. That could factor into it as well. True. This is true. Well, the more that they use it, the more it becomes. um a readily available technology, it brings the cost down. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the less you use it, the more specialized technology it is, the the more expensive it will be. Just like again, the green screens of the day uh, yep. Yep. was very expensive, and then became more and more popular, and anyone and everyone was using it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, a lot of even in just regular sitcom TV shows outside the windows of a lot of apartments that you know the show was shot in was a green screen yeah so, um so yeah that that's that's yet to be seen uh just a, just another interpretation but uh on whole i think i think we're in a good place i think we're in a good place uh, as far as star wars and i i, I am excited for where we're going from here Absolutely. Yeah, the future is bright. You know, I, I know there's an absence of Star Wars films in the pipeline. There's questions about that, but let them figure it out. Let them write the ship. Let them get the stories and the writing in place. And eventually we'll we'll get Star Wars films in the cinema again. But in terms of the TV series, the Disney Plus series, the the, the, the books, the comics... All that stuff. It's a very, very bright future for Star Wars. And if if it's your first entry into the Star Wars galaxy, this is a great time to hop on. And if you're a fan that's been a part of the saga since 1977, then, you know, you're being well fed. Let's just say that. <laughs> yeah. And if I get series produced as well as Kenobi was, I'm OK with skipping the movies for a little while. Sure. Because there's there's so much being flooded into the theaters, and the theaters is still relatively a volatile place mm-hmm. with people, you know, comfortable, not comfortable going back. That if this means more successful life in the uh, Star Wars franchise, 
Who am I to argue with that? Exactly. Exactly. But I will leave you with this last question, Anthony. I'll, I'll let you answer this and then uh, I'll, I'll let you, because I know it's getting late. <laughs> um, Star Wars. Is it starting to become more like Marvel? You know, we've discussed this many times on the show. Is it starting to become more like Marvel where you have to not only have seen the films, but now watch the TV shows to understand characters and references and things that are events that are happening? Case in point, Kenobi. Mm -hmm. If someone hasn't watched Rebels, when the Inquisitors show up, they're not really introduced. You get a quick glance over of who they are. But if you weren't familiar with them from Rebels, you have no idea who these characters are. And, yeah. you know, they, they do have a somewhat significant point. Um, do you think this is becoming more and more of the case that you start need to be a all consumer of Star Wars to be able to enjoy it? Where before it was just the films and it was a little bit easier to, to follow along and understand who characters were. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I think... I think at this point, it is a definitive yes to the TV series, is whether it be the live action ones or the animated ones. I think those are must watch content for any Star Wars fan moving forward. I think even as early as 2016 with Rogue One, Lucasfilm made that a point and a priority, right? With the introduction of Saul Guerrera in, in Rogue One, who was a prominent character in an arc in the Clone Wars. That's where he was introduced and that's where you get a lot of that backstory. Now, it wasn't pivotal to watching the movie, right? You could watch it and then go back and see, oh, he was in Rebels, oh, he was in this, but it wasn't like essential to the plot of it all. Yeah, Whereas, I didn't know who he was because I'd never, I'd never seen Clone Wars before that. Right, but then, if uh, if I may ask, did that inspire you to inquire more about those? And then maybe, you know, you started <laughs> dipping your toes? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, at, at that point, no. Um, what made me go back and want to watch uh, uh, Clone Wars was Ahsoka. Ah, well... Everyone's got their entry point. I'm glad yeah, she was yeah, I mean, for you. And she's because that's a character I wanted to find more out about. And that was my way of finding out. Saw I didn't and see what I didn't realize that he was in there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it was I, a great Easter egg when you got to him eventually, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but especially then even further on with the mall reveal in solo, right? That mm-hmm. was a definitive point to me in the cinema where I was like, all right, these are must watch yep. stories in order to understand what they're doing in the live action realm, at least in terms of the cinema now too, right? Now, I know you can probably, through, you know, people would probably argue against, well, Solo technically isn't a part of the Skywalker saga. Well, in our household, we we watch that chronologically, right? Solo's right there in between uh, episode three and Rogue One, and now Kenobi will fit in there too, right? So when we do our proverbial rewatches of the entire saga, uh, that will fit in there and of course the mall uh reveal at the end is really important because i know there were a lot of people in the in my screening when i saw it the first time they were like who's that he's back how's that possible i saw him get cut in half and in uh in uh the phantom menace and i turned back to somebody's like someone needs to watch clone wars Mm -hmm. (laughs) so the, the fact that they were able to make that big leap and trust the audience to a know that this is a story bit that is part of canon and then B, trust the audience to go back and then absorb those stories is, is really impactful. Um, and now even with the fact that there's an Ahsoka series uh, in the pipeline coming out, um, like and, and from that little trailer that they showcase at Celebration, we know there's a Sabine Wren coming up in that. There's going to be a Hera in that show. You know, uh, Chopper's going to be there. These are pivotal characters from Rebels. Uh, that if you really want to enjoy the Ahsoka series for everything that it is, I doubt they're going to go through every character's back history and story in that series. You know, it already exists. Go watch that. You know, go go take the deep dive into the wonderfulness that is Star Wars Rebels, and then you'll be really able to enjoy. I mean, frankly, I, I forgot to mention this. Cad Bane, too, in, in Book mm-hmm. of Boba Fett, right? Another character that did that leap from the uh the the animated space into the live action one so you know we're 
as we get further on in the Star Wars storytelling universe that they're they're doing now, whether it be Disney Plus or in the films, they are trusting the audience to know all of Star Wars. And they're not differentiating between, all right, this is a TV universe. They don't really, the stories that are told here doesn't impact the the movies and the TV, and the live action series and what's not, whatnot. But now that they're fully embracing all of this, this is really a great time. And frankly, for someone that's been keeping up with all this from, from the, from the beginning, it's been, uh, it's been really wonderful to like be rewarded for my, my, energy and efforts over the the, the the years where I was telling people you should watch this. There's a lot of great stuff. And they're like, but it's never going to matter for the movies. Like, they'll, they won't alienate the audience. And I was like, well, one day they might. Uh, and with that well, solo... You even have Hondo in the theme parks. It's great, great case point, too. Hondo being a part of Smuggler's Run, right? Uh, wonderful, wonderful example there. Um, so, that, and then they're like, Who, well, who's Hondo? Go back, watch Clone Wars, watch Rebels, right? You, you know, that or, time, I did do that. I, I did go, okay, who is this Hondo guy? He's voiced by the amazingly, amazingly talented Jim Cummins. And Absolutely. so I, I, went, I researched that character and looked at him like, this this guy is awesome. <laughs> we, we need more of him, too. And it, he's one of the characters I voted on that I want to see him and come make that leap from animated and theme park now to live action. Definitely, definitely. Again, the sky's the limit. There's an opportunity for these characters at every avenue. And, oh, absolutely. Um, so, frankly, again, with the, the Soka show coming up, too, and Dave Filoni's involvement with that, whew, just get ready. Get get ready. That's, there's going to be a lot more down the pipeline. Oh, indeed. In Filoni, we trust. In Filoni, we trust, indeed. Indeed. I was I was five feet away from him at, celebra- at Celebration. Not actually at Celebration, even. It was at Downtown Disney. We were, me and my wife were going into the Grand Californian Hotel. Uh, they have a special entrance there uh, at, to access Downtown Disney. We were just trying to mm-hmm. escape the crowds and wanted to go into their wonderful lounge that they have in there <laughs> um, for for uh, for a quick drink. And um, we, my wife was like, why is there seven cast members around? Why, why would there just be seven cast members walking together? And then she looked and she's like, oh, there's Favreau and Filoni. She saw the cowboy hat and all that stuff. And she's like, look who it is. And I was like, ah, it's them. <laughs> I, I had a similar situation once when I worked in the Animal Kingdom. And I was walking back from break. And I just saw a bunch of people in suits walking by me. Why are they surrounded by the, you know, everyone standing around this really short guy? And I mean, oh, it's Roy Disney. Oop, that'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> He's royalty in these parts. Oh yes, uh, God rest his soul. That that, that was uh, it, just one of those special little moments. That I didn't speak a word to him, didn't say anything, but just the fact that you know, just being that close to someone so uh, pivotal to my fandom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, 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 I'm, I'm happy for you that you had a similar moment with, with two such. Uh, they've earned our trust. Absolutely. They, I mean, let them continue to create. That's all I can say. <laughs> yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, Anthony, please tell everyone uh, where they need to be looking to find your spectacular show, which I I, I listen every week. Um, you do a great job. Uh, keep it up. Um, if you're not listening to Force Ghost Conversation, be sure to be listening to this guy in Force Ghost Conversation. He is a breath of fresh air in the podcast universe. Um, please tell tell everyone where to find you and on your wonderful social media presence as well. Well, thank you so much for that. I really appreciate you listening and for the kind words there. It means it means a lot. I mean, this is a podcast that really inspires me to do what I do week to week. So, really, kudos to you as well. I, it um, got me blushing. <laughs> well, you can find Forest Ghost Conversations anywhere that you can really find podcasts. Uh, so, whether it be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher. If, if there's a podcast site, you know, we're probably on it in some way, shape, or form. And if not, reach out to me and we'll try and get our way on there in some way, shape, or form. Uh, so if you liked what you heard here, be sure to check us out there. Force Ghost Conversations is your home for cozy, deep dive discussions to all things Star Wars. So on a weekly basis, we talk about the movies, the the, the books, the comics, the TV series, uh, all that. That's your home for all that. So come on over and check us out. 
You can also follow us on uh, all the social media channels. Uh, we're on Twitter at Force Ghost Pod, and then Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. You can just search Force Ghost Conversations, and we will appear. Awesome. Definitely, definitely a worthy, fo- worthy follow on everything, and some nice TikTok content as well, versus some of the other crazy TikTok content. <laughs> <laughs> Try to keep it fun and interesting for you over there. Oh, you do a good job. You do a good job. So thank you again for coming on. Thank you so much. Thanks again to Anthony from Force Ghost Conversation for joining me. What an honor. What a pleasure. Uh, We've been working to get this done for quite some time, so finally get to have Anthony King on here. Great guy. Definitely highly suggest checking out Force Ghost Conversations on your podcast feed. Um, Good time. Uh, Good good content. I forgot. I completely forgot while we're recording to ask Anthony what was his grade. Between 1 and 10, what was his grade of Kenobi, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series on Disney Plus. And if you know Anthony, this would not come as a surprise. If you don't know Anthony, then this shouldn't come as a surprise, but it may. He gave it and to infinity and beyond. So mixing of uh cultures here, but to infinity and beyond. So 10 plus 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 plus. Uh he absolutely loved it. Uh, particularly he's a fan of the prequels that was like he said that was his movies so the fact that he got Kenobi he got Ewan McGregor as Kenobi he had Hayden Christians back as as Vader you just a beautiful marriage of everything that he loved as a child growing up to now being an adult and still getting more of it I completely understand where he's going from on there and Kudos to him. Kudos to all of you. What was your grade? What is your grade of the Kenobi series altogether? I think last time I asked what was your grade on episode 6. Now I want to know on the series altogether. Let us know. Join on the conversation on our Facebook group. Facebook.com slash group slash Disney Marvels Podcast. On Instagram at Disney Marvels Podcast. TikTok at Disney Marvels Podcast. And on the Twitter at Disney Marvels. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we're going to be starting our live. Yes, our summer live episodes will be starting this weekend, I believe. I I believe I am working out in my schedule. My personal schedule has started this weekend. So make sure you are subscribed to there. Turn on the notifications. This way, when we go live, you will know about it. And you want to join in on those conversations because it's where we get to internet interact directly instead of you just listening you get to join in on the conversations this way you and um it's a little more of a a lax atmosphere in uh if you don't get to see be part of the live that's fine i will post the audio to the feed as well shortly thereafter usually the monday after uh saturday nights are usually when we go live anyway or you can be part of the regular show you can do this by leaving a voice message through the anchor app or anchor.fm website or record a message electronically on your smartphone your tablet or your computer and email it to disneymarvels at gmail.com you could also email any questions or suggestions you may have to that address as well don't forget to check out the latest Disney Marvel blogs over at DisneyMarvels.blogspot.com. Links to all these are in the show notes. I do want to let you know now. A little inside information. We are going to be doing some work on our online presence. Um, I am working to bring back the Disney Marvels page. Uh, that, that went away a little over a year ago. Um, I, I've been quite bitter about that, but... Uh, I, I am in the process of trying to get something new going again. Um, the Facebook group will still be there, but I'm going to try and shift everything over to over to the Disney Marvel's Facebook page. So 
going to be an official page again. And stay tuned to the group. Stay tuned to the podcast when this will happen. I will try and let everyone know anywhere and everywhere possible. I want to thank you for your time. I know how little time we all have these days. And the fact that we get to spend some of it together means a lot to me. means a lot to everyone over here at Disney Marvel's podcast. I cannot thank you and we cannot thank you enough. But if you could please, please go over to Apple Podcasts, go over to uh, Spotify, and leave a rating. Uh, Leave a rank, leave a rating for the show. We have all five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts right now. We uh, Truly, truly, from uh, the the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you. I, I cannot... Uh, believe how blessed I am that I get to do this uh, time and time again and this is the response that you guys give to us and um, thank you thank you but keep it coming keep it coming the more reviews that we get particularly the five star ones the more Apple and Spotify will do their part promoting our show and that it really does help out because the more people in this family the better it is um, won't believe in a big Disney family, and so do I. Plus, um, if you can't do the Apple or the Spotify, that's okay. Share it out on the social networks. Share it on Twitter, Facebook, whatever, whatever social media you use, and whichever streaming service you use. Share a link. Share a link so other people can discover the show as well. Don't forget to subscribe to the show while you're at it. This way you always know when new episodes are posted. And while you're at it, consider becoming a premium subscriber to help really help the show out. Movie reviews, equipment, uh, just it really will help the show out. You can do this over at anchor.fm slash disneymarvel slash support or find our Patreon page. You can also check out some merchant our merchandise shop to get yourself some fun disney marvel podcast stuff there as well new stuff will be coming shortly i have a few things in the works as we talk you can find links to all these in the show notes as well because remember this show is brought to you by listeners like you whatever you're facing out there whatever troubles whatever darkness and I, i know these are troubled times for a lot of us and Things aren't as, not that they were ever easy, but things just seem to keep getting more and more difficult. Don't give up. Don't give in. I know it's easy for me to say you are not alone. And at times, and many times, you probably feel that you are. But believe me, there are people who care about you. There are people who love you. And there are people that are willing to help you. They may be... A relative, they may be a close friend, they may be a complete stranger. Never give up, never give in. Be your own hero and step forward. Let your light shine for the world to see because you are beautiful, you are special. There is no one else like you in the world needs you. Now I'd like to end this week's show with a quote from Walt Disney himself. Being that it was just Independence Day? Recently, I was invited to see a show on America. And as I sat there watching and listening, I felt both proud and thrilled. Thrilled with the voices. Thrilled with the sounds. Proud of the group of 100 talented young Americans singing about our country. The songs that made me proud of being an American. Again, that was Walt Disney. Thank you again for listening, everyone, and I'll see you next time.